In sport, to make history means to break new ground. To set new standards for excellence. To build upon precedent and stride into new territory. And to make history means to fashion unimagined drama. To author moments and images one wants to see again and again. To relive, to actually believe. The 2015 U.S. Open Championship, even before the very first tee shot was struck, promised to make history, unsurpassed drama, new ways to measure and define greatness, an ascendant generation of men to push the game and themselves toward new heights. History was in the air. A sense that a new era in golf would find its full realization its confirmation in a region of America that was making history in its own right. Indeed, there was, for all to witness, a new era heralding Spieth's Northwest conquest. Here we are, gathered in the Pacific Northwest for the U.S. Open Championship. What's regarded as golf's ultimate test had never been in this part of the country before. This week, Chambers Bay, an American original if ever there was one, would serve as a grand stage for the emergence of a new era in golf. A forum for a new era golfer. And not just one, many. It was reflective of a shift in the game on the shifting tides of Puget Sound. Look at this place, broad, windblown, different, exciting, demanding. Yet another instance of how this year's U.S. Open was symbolic of a new era in the sport. After years of preparation, the 115th U.S. Open at Chambers Bay was here. One year after a remarkable U.S. Open at Pinehurst, where Martin Keimer was untouchable, winning by eight. And Martin Keimer is a U.S. Open champion at Pinehurst. Who would it be this time? What about Aussie Jason Day? 27 years old, a major talent, who arrived at Chambers Bay looking for his first major. 39-year-old Tiger Woods, steadfast over the entirety of his career in pursuit of Jack Nicklaus's major championship record of 18 titles. Our 108th U.S. Open champion, Tiger Woods. But he hadn't won a professional event in 22 months. He hadn't won a major championship in seven years and was stuck on 14 majors. Trying to make a shift under game time situations tough and try not to revert back into old patterns. Um, but as I said, the shift isn't very much. Uh, we, we've, we've implemented a lot of the big stuff already, so now it's just fine tuning. Woods arrived at Chambers Bay ranked an unfathomable 195th in the world, yet still was the game's biggest draw. 30-year-old Dustin Johnson, a mercurial talent possessing a powerful game, arrived at Chambers Bay playing some of the finest golf of his career. And in just his fifth event back, Dustin Johnson is going to win this WGC championship with a par at the last by one. In February, four months before the U.S. Open, Johnson had returned to golf after a half-year absence to deal with what he called personal challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. For the past few years, no one has done it quite as well as the 26-year-old from Northern Ireland. Rory McIlroy, winner of four major championships and two in the previous year, came to Chambers Bay as the top-ranked player in the world. As a number one player, can that be a psychological ploy for you? When I look at the world rankings and I see my name up at the top, and you know, if you look back for the last four or five years, you know, I, you know, I guess I've I've won more majors than anyone else in that time period. Do I feel like the best player in the world? Yes, and obviously I want to go out every week and, and try to back that up and show that. Another U.S. Open champion from Northern Ireland. Real performance from Rory McIlroy, the 2011 United States Open champion. Ranked second in the world, 
21-year-old Jordan Spieth came to Chambers Bay after winning the Masters by four. A grand slam was in play. I've now told myself I have a chance to make history in many ways, but in order to do that, I have to really focus on this week, focus on the major championships and how I'm going to prepare for them. 21. Rory, 26. Jason Day, 27. So many other 20-somethings. The game had never been more awash in young talent. This, too, was part of the history being made for it almost felt as if the generation that had grown up watching and emulating Tiger was now competing to create its own legacy. Always a part of any conversation about U.S. Open contenders, Phil Mickelson, with his record six runner-up finishes in the championship, was seeking the one thing missing from his sparkling golf resume, a victory in the championship he coveted above all. Something I really would love to do is to complete the career Grand Slam. I feel like I'm in the best shape I've been in. If I continue to, uh, to do what I've done the last eight months or so, there's no reason why I couldn't. The best players in the game, never more athletic and more worldly than it was in that third week of June in 2015, were gathering in a spectacular nook near Tacoma, Washington, to play in a U.S. Open that everybody knew, before the first shot was struck, would be like none of the U.S. Opens that preceded it. The players, from around the globe, descended on Chambers Bay for their practice rounds. There was a lot of work to be done, and not a lot of time to do it. Can you show me where you like that stack that you went to field? Okay, so if you didn't change anything from here, this stays the same and you went to the top, it's already there. Chambers Bay promised to be a stout challenge. Driving, iron play, chipping and pitching, and putting, of course physical endurance, and last but by no means least, mental focus. When I think of Chambers Bay, I don't necessarily think of the Puget Sound, I don't think necessarily the fescue, I'll just think of a bounce of a ball. This golf course, I mean, it's going to be challenging, very demanding, but you're also going to have to use a lot of imagination around here. Uh, there's a lot of slopes and bouncing the ball in places. The U.S. Open had never been played on a course with such broad, firm fairways and with such large, deep bunkers and large, undulating greens. Yes, the Chambers Bay Greens. Before the week was over, the Chambers Bay Greens would be a subject of conversation and some controversy all over the world. Well, there's a lot of greens here that it's not like you can run the ball in. You might have to go you know, to one side of the green or the other to sort of bank them in. You know, it, it, There's a lot of greens that are like bowls, but you're still going to have to play shots up in the air and try and get a little bit of spin on them to control it somewhat on these greens. This is a little severe. You've got to control your golf ball into the green to get it to stay somewhere near, near the hole. There's obviously a lot of undulation. Everything's very extreme. It's all on the side of this hill, and so the elevation change is what you're going to have to get used to. You got to have a good feel of your speed and, and uh, long range putting is going to be crucial I think and there's going to be a lot of putts from outside the greens as well and it's going to be a few minutes on the putting green that's for sure. It's hard enough to play a course where you know every hump and hollow. Here nearly every player in the field was playing a course he did not know. Are the trains a distraction out there? I, uh, I, don't, I don't really think they're a distraction. I mean I'll, I'm going to try not to hit them but uh, we can stay away from that, that'd be great. One man did have a powerful connection to the course. He wasn't one of the 156 players, but he was the next best thing. For years, Michael Greller was a local school teacher and weekend caddy at Chambers Bay. But for the past two or so years, he had been Jordan Spieth's full-time caddy. Together, they'd been part of nine major championships the caddy had a feel for the course, but even he knew it would take a lot of work for anyone to feel prepared for Thursday. It's awesome, I mean, we have as much experience as anybody out there, which is the only time we've really ever had that, so. He also got married there almost two years ago. I went for his wedding and I played it after they had redone it. So I got an extra little practice round in there. Oh, I'll try and learn too. <laughs> People think that I know it so well, I mean, I really don't. You know, I'm comfortable here. But as far as knowing all the nuances, I mean, I caddied for guys that can't break 90. 
I pretty much had to throw that little experience I had out the window. And you know, I was out here last week working pretty hard to try and compensate for that. I think it's going to help driving the ball, the sight lines and understanding when things get firm. He's going to know where it would run off to a little better maybe. I think uh, off the tee it's really going to help. History had already been made, bringing the U.S. Open Championship to the Pacific Northwest. For the men, too, history was on the line. The curtain on the 115th U.S. Open Championship was about to be lifted. Over the next four days and 72 holes, thousands of swings would slash through the air and thousands of putts would be struck amid hushed silence. In this new era of golf, as history unfolded, there were multiple contenders, but only one who would be crowned champion. The 115th playing of the United States Open Championship. You're going to have a lot of fun watching this uh, championship unfold. If you're a multi-dimensional player, you're going to play this golf course extremely well. Terrible lie in that bunker and a terrible place to be on this course. A nice golf shot there. That was done beautifully. And now the players, 156 of the best players in the world, were at Chambers Bay. Over the span of four rounds, a champion would be crowned. Texas and Spain, California and Japan, Utah and Sweden, Florida and Northern Ireland, Georgia and Argentina. To win a US Open, you have to beat the world. Phil Mickelson. Trying to win his first United States Open, six times a runner-up. Representing the United States, Phil Mickelson almost immediately grabbed a share of the spotlight. Oh. On the par 5 eighth, he had the opportunity to take sole possession of the lead. For birdie on number eight. Oh, good stroke. Very confident, I like his chances this week. The 45-year-old would finish with a one under 69, giving his many fans hope that this would be the year when Phil would finally win the US Open and complete the career Grand Slam. Now he's got that smile on his face. Young Jordan Spieth, not even half Phil's age, finished a shot better than him in round one, affirming the idea that he was one of the championship's top contenders. So I wouldn't be at all surprised come Sunday afternoon. He's sitting there. Spieth's first round 68 saw him make the turn at even par. But with birdies on 11, 12, and 13, he was undoubtedly warming up. Well done there for Jordan. That's three birdies in a row. Great start here for the 21-year-old Masters champion. Still, Jordan Spieth's first round was anything but easy. We had some gettable pins, but I didn't strike the ball particularly well. Um, I wasn't pleased with the way I hit it. The players, the caddies, the officials, the media, the whole world, really, they were seeing the same thing. This Chambers Bay golf course was for real. We've got a very challenging course that is intriguing in so many ways. It took no time for the course to make its presence known, to show how it would be an essential part of the history being made. It was a tough adjustment when we got on the course because there were some holes that started to get quicker when you're downhill. The hardest part is trying to leave yourself below the hole and you can't because the, the, the putts coming down the hills are just, <laughs> it's, it, they're tough to make, put it that way. There was that element, again, back to you have to figure out where your ball's gonna bounce and roll to. It's not just throwing darts. It was so fast, so firm, some reveled in it. My initial impressions were that I liked the course a lot. And it, it was more so the conditions, like the firm and fast conditions. And I enjoy being able to use the ground and, and use the slopes and have a little imagination. This is incredible. How good is that, Greg? <laughs> the golf course is definitely holding its own. If, but if you hit quality shots and hit good shots, you got some chances and some looks for birdie. So it was a great test, I feel like, this first day. And the fans loved it all. 
The galleries are tremendous. The anticipation is tremendous. There's been a lot of support out here from this community, a lot of people out here. It's cool to see. You've got to make it to the 18th grandstand, too, to watch, the, watch them coming in. That's going to be great. Fans here are great. I can understand why uh, the Seahawks fans are, are pretty intimidating at times. The crowd was in it today. Fans always want to see spectacular golf. The players do their best to give it to them. It's a grind out here. There's a lot of guys that have, you know, come into this day already frustrated at the course, how long it can be and how tough it can be. That's the US Open for you, patience, acceptance. It's gonna wear us out for sure. You can definitely tell that it's gonna take more out of us than a normal course. There's steep kind of climbs over dunes and over some sort of pathways to get us from green to tee. With as many times as you have to go uphill, downhill, side hill, this golf course would be the one that would test you the most. How are most 15-year-olds challenging themselves the first week of summer? Cole Hammer of Houston was playing in golf's ultimate test. As the amateur began his round, this reality seemed to hit home. Third youngest ever to compete in the U.S. Open. Go get him, kid. Not happy with it off the club face. But not a terrible result. Looked like it might try to hop back into the fairway. But even for those who had experienced the aura of the U.S. Open before, Thursday's round, right from the outset, offered a challenge to every aspect of their game. He bogeyed eight of his last nine opening holes on the PGA Tour. Come on. that nine of his last ten. And it would get worse. Whoa. Well, it's getting ugly. And he just duffed it. Nothing's harder to watch than that. Tiger's opening round 80 left him near the bottom at the close of Thursday. Not very happy, that's for sure. No, just couldn't quite get it turned around today. Playing with Tiger, Louis Oosthuizen the 2010 British Open champion, shot a 77. Shocking scores, really. The third member of that group, Ricky Fowler, who had won the Players' Championship in May, came in with an equally disappointing 81, despite a scintillating eagle on the drivable par 4 12th. And now Ricky Fowler, just needing something good to happen. Well, that's something good. Yeah, it's gonna come back off that hill. This could be something extremely good. That's gonna... Come on. Come on. Yeah, this is what we were talking Come about. On. Is he gonna do it? Come on. Ricky Fowler. Shane. Oh! Nearly with an ace on the 12th. A tough day so far, but that's a sure eagle for Fowler. The 2011 U.S. Open champion, Rory McIlroy, couldn't seem to find his rhythm and finished with a two over 72. Rory crushes that one. In all, Thursday saw 25 of the 156 finish under par. One of them, Jason Day, was part of the pack two under. Beautiful up and down from the left rough there. Day's opening round 68 left him in a tie with Spieth and others, three shots behind first round leaders, the powerful duo of Henrik Stenson of Sweden and American Dustin Johnson. Their first round 65s had everyone buzzing. Johnson would birdie five of his first 15 holes. Then, on the par 4 7th, he had the chance for another. Boy, well judged again. He's putting well, he's playing well. Six under. Six under meant that Johnson had a chance at producing the lowest round in championship history. That chance was soon derailed. Watch this ball, Jay. This is going down to the right. Can you believe it? A par on eight left history still within his grasp. Dustin Johnson needing one more birdie to tie for the lowest round ever in a U.S. Open. But a bogey four left him short. Oh! Ran out of gas. And so a bogey at his final hole. And a round of 65. At the moment, good enough for a one-shot lead. I feel like I'm in pretty good shape. You know, I try to just 
you know, stay calm and, and just focus on the next shot that I got to hit. Got off to a nice, solid start. Dustin Johnson has arrived. For Stenson, his late flurry began with a birdie on 14. Beautiful stroke for Stenson and a very legitimate contender here. Carried to 15. Oh, and he's starting to roll it well, Greg. Extended to 16. Puts him at four under par. And ended at the par five, 18th. Birdie and a tie for the lead. Yes, sir. Great putt, great stroke. The group that would enter Friday under par represented nine different nations. There was an amateur, Brian Campbell, sitting two shots off the pace. The cut was looming for some of the biggest names in golf. In this new era, a host of 20-somethings were making their presence felt. Only one round into this 115th US Open, the sense that history was unfolding was felt everywhere. Of the 25 players who had finished the first round of the 115th U.S. Open Championship under par, two, Americans Ali Schneiderjans and Brian Campbell, were amateurs. Two of the 16 amateurs who had qualified for this history-making championship at Chambers Bay. And early on Friday, the 22-year-old Campbell collected birdies on two of the first three holes. The second thrust him onto center stage. Oh, oh, we have a joint leader, the 2014 All-American and Big Ten Player of the Year, Brian Campbell. Like Campbell, American Patrick Reed would enjoy a leadership position on Friday. The 24-year-old made an eagle on 12 to get to seven under. After two bogeys, the leaderboard shifted again. Patrick to tap in for birdie for the lead. Reed was now one shot better than Dustin Johnson, who had recorded a one under 35 on the front nine. This is for birdie. Johnson's co-leader after Thursday, Henrik Stenson, was finding the course after that first round 65 to be less accommodating. That was a good stroke though. Making the turn a two over for the round, the Swede was unable to get anything going. Ooh. That hurts. Stenson, who closed out Friday in a tie for 12th, wasn't the only big name to be vexed by Chambers Bay. Yeah. Rory McIlroy, too, would acutely feel the swings and momentum brought on by this singular course. That can happen here at the US Open. He hit a pretty good iron shot, walks away with a double bogey. A second round 72 left the world number one at four over, staring at a steep uphill climb toward contention. And four over, 72-72. Just could not get it going today. No, not at all. Facing even a greater challenge was Phil Mickelson, whose first round 69 must have seemed like a distant memory by the time he closed out a second round, 74. That was his first poor stroke he made. Phil Mickelson for par, and in some trouble here. Phil now four over on the day. If Mickelson had captured much of the attention on Thursday, 27-year-old Jason Day, playing with Jordan Spieth, captured everyone's attention on Friday. At first, the focus was on his game. Likes to use the slope. Now that is carrying entirely too much speed. Watch where this one ends up. Yeah. That, that wasn't the proper shot to hit there. And then that focus shifted. Jason Day has uh, just slipped and fallen here on nine and is still on the ground. I was walking with him. Next thing I know, I turned around. I think he had just gotten dizzy and, and slipped and fell. Jason Day, who can't get up. That's just scary. Just to be having a, a conversation and just walking down the fairway and then suddenly he's on the ground is pretty alarming. The camera's down. The camera's, down. The camera's down. At that point, it was, 
you know, how can we help them out and, and kind of clear the scene and, and try and keep the cameras off and let them just, just rebound. In spite of a bout with extreme dizziness, rebound he did. But it's a U.S. Open, so, you know, he just dug deeper than he's ever dug before. Here's hoping he can slug it out and stay in this. There was an element of heroism in that second round 70. Courage, determination, and just the willingness to keep going. For Day's fellow competitor Jordan Spieth on that same Friday, the defending Masters champ experienced just about everything. There was the good. Go, 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 go. Well, we saw that a lot yesterday. Another great mid-range putt, another birdie. And the frustrating. It's the dumbest hole I've ever played in my life. That is so dumb. I think 18 as a par four doesn't make much sense. Unbelievably stupid. It's not a par four. I'm not gonna put a smile on and be happy with the way I played the hole. You know, if it's going to be a par four and you're going to bring that other bunker into play, then the, I think the tee should have been moved up more. But I'm not design, I'm not the one that's putting the course together. So I thought it was a dumb hole today, but I think we're going to play it from there again. So I've got to get over that. It wouldn't be a U.S. Open championship if there wasn't some grumbling about the course. That tradition is as old as the game itself. The consistency of each green is kind of different. I guess that's really all I can say about it. It's different. All the oh way across God. the fairway. I don't know, it's, it's borderline laughable at, at some of the greens, and it's uh, pretty much like putting on broccoli. And that is a tough three putt for Henrik Stenson. It's kind of a bipolar golf course. I think it's, it's the kind of course that will expose you, and I, I think a lot of players have felt that. Not left with much of an option there. No, not at all. You know, this is a very unique, different kind of test, but having said that, it is true to what people think about the U.S. Open, which is a very tough test. The 2015 U.S. Open at Chambers Bay was following a rich lineage that began at Newport Golf Club in 1895, one pitting the course and the players as combatants. The fact is, everybody plays the same course. Usually, the winner has the most profound understanding of that truth and the patience to abide by it. It's simply history. We remember Ben Hogan in 1951 at Oakland Hills or Justin Rose at Marion. That's what's going to make this. It's that, hey, this was a hard test of golf and I beat 155 of the best players around and I am the US Open champion. Displaying many of those necessary traits, Spieth put his frustrations behind him to shoot a three under 67. South African Brandon Grace followed up a first round 69 with his own 67 on Friday. Putting it is the way to do it. Right, Corey? Wow. It, it was right there, that's for sure. <laughs> Chance of a two here. But he's done it. Great putt from the South African. Significant move this morning on this US Open leaderboard. Only two men went lower than Spieth and Grace on Friday. American J.B. Holmes, and South African Louis Oosthuizen, who shot a 66 to distance himself from an exasperating first round and qualify for the weekend. Oosthuizen is playing brilliantly. Playing in the same group, Ricky Fowler would not be so fortunate and would be done after Friday. Ricky Fowler has had a brutal last couple of holes. I think these guys are ready to get off the golf course, to tell you the truth. In addition, the cut claim defending champion Martin Keimer and big hitting Bubba Watson and young Cole Hammer. And this year, missing just his second cut in 19 U.S. Opens, Tiger. On a, on a golf course like this, you know, you get exposed. You got to be so precise, you got to have everything dialed in. And uh, I've, obviously, I didn't have that. One of the greatest athletes absolutely lost. Tigers really struggled, and, and it was sad. Two momentous and dramatic rounds of the 115th U.S. Open Championship were in the books, and even more than before, the promise of making history could be felt everywhere. The first 36 holes had already inspired images that would never be forgotten, had already revealed how beautiful this game can be when the best are challenged like never before, had already offered so many signs and symbols of how a new era in the game was being affirmed. 
It is day three, round three. The expectations are high. The top of the leaderboard was loaded with talent, although largely unproven in U.S. Open play. Anybody with an even par to five under has got a chance of winning this national championship. At the top, the young Texans Jordan Spieth and Patrick Reed. Both had played in the 2010 U.S. Amateur at Chambers Bay. Chasing the Texans were Dustin Johnson, Brandon Grace, Louis Oosthuizen, and still battling vertigo, Jason Day. Is he feeling 100%? No. It'll be interesting to see, as he goes out there today, how his balance is. The world number one, at least, had experience going for him. Rory McIlroy looking for a hot start. He really does want to get himself into the position for Sunday. McIlroy had won a US Open championship before, but he was nine shots back, tied for 44th. Needs to warm up that putter. He'll be right back in this championship. US Open weekends are always emotional, trying, demanding in the extreme. And at this US Open, as the golfers were battling each other on a challenging and unique course, tension and anxiety were palpable. This green and brown golf course has shown its teeth to the best golfers in the world. And as the stakes were raised, questions lingered. How would the USGA officials, led by executive director Mike Davis, set up the course? How would the 75 players who made the 36-hole cut navigate the ultimate test in golf? You know, that's one of the great things here at Chambers Bay is that, the, you know, not only do we have a lot of options in how we set the golf course up, the players have a lot of options. When you look at the big picture, you got to understand what the USGA is trying to achieve. Test these guys mentally and physically. We want to make sure that we're testing shot-making skills. We want to reward recovery, distance control, the ability to play your shots around the greens. And boy, did he judge this right. That was perfect. Mike Davis, he wants everyone to love US Open. He wants the players to be happy. But as, as a setup man, he has to push this course to the edge to make it as interesting and unique as possible. Of course, it's going to be playing in the wind today, but there's a hummock out there that you've got to carry at 300 in the air to knock it over. The bumpy greens, the, the kvetching on social media, I mean, I'm sure that he's hearing that, he's feeling it. One of those contending for the 2015 US Open Championship was Jason Day, who was battling more than just the course. For the last time he was on the course, it was in the middle of a nightmarish scene. How did the resilient Australian even finish his round? And would he be able to come back on Saturday? If you're Jason Day, and you've been dealing with vertigo-like symptoms for better than a month, that's just scary. A methodical and carefully pieced together third round 68 answered that question. And every step of the way, his round got more inspiration. There was a, a number of times throughout the round where, you know, he looked like he wasn't really going to make it, but he had some really, really good shots despite, you know, feeling very uncomfortable for a lot of the day. What a great effort by Jason Day. Day was resolute and focused. He surely wanted more, but he was thrilled to just be playing. As were the six amateurs who made the cut. Six, the most amateurs to make the cut since 1966. We have almost 10,000 people who try to qualify for the U.S. Open every year, many of which are amateurs, but to have six make the cut, it's roughly 10% of the people making the cut were amateurs, so that says a lot about the next generation. Could somebody from that group win? An amateur had last won the U.S. Open in 1933. It was not likely to happen in 2015. For now, the amateurs in the field were playing in a competition within a competition. They were playing to see who among them would shoot the lowest score over the four days and earn the USGA's special medal, annually awarded to the low amateur in the field. In his first US Open back in 1990 at Medina, Phil Mickelson won that medal. 25 years later, Phil was still at it at Chambers Bay. By Saturday afternoon, he wasn't in a position to win. Now Phil at the third for par. Oh. Phil seems a little bit edgier this week to me. A lot of undue pressure on himself wanting that U.S. Open title. His shot at the career Grand Slam would have to wait until next year. Still searching for his first U.S. Open championship. Doesn't look like it'll come here in Washington. Moving up on the leaderboard was Rory McIlroy, finishing Saturday in a tie for 25th. 
but an even round 70 filled with missed putts was not nearly enough. And he's let one slide here on this 11th. With a second consecutive 66, Louis Oosthuizen's first round 77 felt like an aberration. Louis was now firmly in the mix for his first US Open championship title. While Oosthuizen was making a run, Dustin Johnson was making history with his driving and would finish his round hitting every fairway and driving the greens on the par 4 12th and 16th holes. Oh, man. How about Dustin Johnson's shape here? With a breathtaking blend of power and accuracy, greens more than 300 yards away from the tee box were within Johnson's sights. Coming around here, it's not done yet. This is called a full turn. And that's what you call a shellacking down the 18th hole. Effortless power is just incredible. As for the remaining contenders, Saturday's action would weed out the players who simply weren't ready to win. Not now, not here. We started the day as 16 guys under par, now we have eight. After 54 holes of the US Open. We are in for some fantastic finish. By the end of this sun-washed day, four players would share the top of the leaderboard the most since 1973 at Oakmont. Spieth, Johnson, Day, and Grace. Brandon Grace from South Africa was to many your dark horse. The US Open Championship is famous for those who emerge from the shadows, and sometimes they win. We all dream of this, and we all practice for this, so um, it's just a matter of fact if you grab it or, or you don't. Boy, oh, that's a fantastic putt. I played really good today under the pressure, so I think I'm in, a, I'm in a good frame of mind going to tomorrow. Also in the top four was Jason Day, a seasoned 27-year-old who had won over the fans, the media, and his fellow competitors with his remarkable play on Saturday. What a great effort by Jason Day today to keep himself in this championship. The other two in that leading foursome were two of the biggest names in the game, Floridian Dustin Johnson, and Jordan Spieth of Dallas, Texas. Spieth seemed to have the ability to guide his ball and have it follow instructions as an act of the mind as much as anything else. Oh, good putt there, it rolled perfectly. While Johnson had reminded everyone of how effortless his game could look. I know what it takes. I just really need to go out, you know, stick to my game plan. It didn't look quite as simple for Spieth. For after being one of only five in the field to shoot under par on both Thursday and Friday, Spieth had to work hard on the 18th. Second shot. It's laid up beautifully right there. It's a good spot. To finish with a one over 71. Oh. Yeah, he didn't play well, but it was a good gutsy performance there. Spieth came to Chambers Bay as the 2015 Masters champion. He was trying to become only the sixth player to win the Masters and the US Open Championship in the same year. The five men who had done that Craig Wood, Ben Hogan, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, and Tiger Woods. It's all on execution. Mentally, I think I'll be um, strong enough to pull it off. Johnson came to Chambers Bay looking to build upon what he described as a reconstituted life. I'm swinging really well, so if I can put together a solid round tomorrow, you never know what happens. In other words, the two men were in very different places, except on the leaderboard of the 115th US Open Championship a Sunday afternoon away from emerging out of the tension and drama to claim a part of history. How you doing? Good, how are you? Welcome to the Open. Thank you. Do you know what today is? Um, what's today? What's a special day today? Sunday! Father's Day! Yeah, there you go! And Sunday! Yes, and Sunday! <laughs> and the final round! And the final round! There you go, one for you, one for you. Have a great day, enjoy Thank the Open. You. Well, these views don't get old, do they? Happy Father's Day, everybody. And welcome to the final round of the 115th United States Open Championship here at Chambers Bay in University Place, Washington. All across the world, people were watching the US Open Championship, eager to see how this piece of sporting theater was about to unfold. The feeling was tangible, that this final day would offer the type of drama that makes only a select few sporting events stand the test of time. Heading into the fourth and final round, it looked like a four-man race. 
Who will win it? Spieth, Johnson, Day, and Grace all four under. That is, until the world's top-ranked golfer played his way into contention. Can Rory McIlroy make some noise and put some pressure on these guys back there at four under? We got a lot of time to go. Rory McIlroy, winner of multiple events earlier in 2015, was suddenly mounting a serious charge. They're really aggressive right now, which is great to see. Has nothing to lose at this juncture. Five under for Rory, one under. And that does wake up a few of the guys up before they've teed off. Yeah, they've got the world number one getting hot out there. Suddenly, the top-ranked golfer in the world was in it, behind a run of six birdies in the space of 13 holes. 72 feet downhill swinger. Could it be? How about that? Six under now on the day, gaining quickly on the men at the top. But then, just as suddenly, he wasn't. After getting to within two strokes of the leaders, bogeys on 15 and 17 all but eliminated McElroy from contention. Ends up with a 66 today, and even par for the championship. A back nine that what could have been. At U.S. Opens, fortunes and places in history change suddenly. Remember Louis Oosthuizen's early struggles? The 77 he shot playing with Tiger Woods and Ricky Fowler? Well, Louis, who recorded the lowest scores on Friday and Saturday, by Sunday was very much in the mix. After a par at 11, a brilliant tee shot and birdie at 12 moved Louis to one over for the championship. Then, his third shot on the par 4 14th jolted Chambers Bay. What a swing there. Oh, just a beautiful looking pitch. And what a shot for a birdie! <laughs> Who stays and joins the club under par? Just when you think you're out of it at a U.S. Open, it's one on the back nine on Sunday, right? This for his fourth birdie in a row. Jason Day, in the wake of his gutty performance on Friday and Saturday, was finding out he had more fans than he could ever have imagined. From Australia, Jason Day. But despite the encouragement, continuing to play through vertigo was one more challenge on top of the existing ones. He's put up a valiant effort, shown a lot of courage, resiliency, and obviously shown extremely good golf too, but that one may have just knocked him out of the championship. Despite day sliding and Louis rising, as Sunday wore on, the core group at the top of the leaderboard remained largely unchanged. Dustin Johnson had jumped out to an early lead on the front nine. Johnson held the lead at six under before three bogeys in the space of four holes brought him back down to the firm earth of Chambers Bay. Meanwhile, Brandon Grace was making a birdie on 12 to move to five under. The Chambers Bay greens, challenging by design, rendered bumpy and uneven in spots by long, warm, sun-drenched days, were deeply in the heads of the game's best players. Jordan Spieth's final round had begun with a bogey on the first hole. A three-putt from Jordan Spieth to start his day. Yeah, tough start for Jordan. Spieth shook it off quickly and regained his usual excellent form through sheer force of will. Sit down, ball. Down. Down for it. Easy. Easy. And by way of an adept touch on the green. Like Grace, Spieth's birdie at 12 moved him to five under. That's an unbelievable touch. That may be the best putt you've seen all day from back then. Meanwhile, Louis Oosthuizen, with a birdie on 16, had moved to three under for the championship. Looking at the hole as well, taking his focus off the stroke. Five birdies in a row now. While Oosthuizen, Johnson, and Spieth each own multiple major championship top 10 finishes. 
Brandon Grace ranked 40th in the world heading into the U.S. Open. Out! Was proving he belonged on his first Sunday afternoon visit to golf's major stage. I don't know that people should be surprised that Brandon Grace is playing as well as he is here at this Lynx style course. His game really seems to suit this style of a golf course. Right at it. Hitting it well, putting it well. This guy is not going away. This to stay five under and tied for the lead. To the par four, 16th, they go. It was late Sunday at Chambers Bay, and the tension was building. When I walked off of 15 green, I accidentally glanced at the scoreboard. I didn't mean to, uh, just in turning back and watching Brennan finish, it was up there, and I saw that he and I were then tied for the lead, and we were too clear. And that's when I started to feel a little extra pressure going to 16. 16 today, just 337 yards, 35 yards shorter than yesterday. Guys will be going at this green with drivers today. The hole was a beautiful par four, short, but very narrow. You see, they've set it on a three, would you really only have to carry the ball about 260 yards. It's depending on the bounce, will easily get to the green. Bob Jones once observed that nobody ever wins the U.S. Open. Somebody loses it. Quiet, please. Thank you. For some, he was right, way right. Way right, it might be out of bounds. That's gone, Zach. Have not seen a ball that far right all week here at 16. Brandon Grace and Jordan Spieth had arrived at the 16th tee in a two man tie for first. But following his tee shot that went out of bounds, Grace's double bogey six pretty much marked the end of his run. As for his fellow competitor, the skid's got a flair for the dramatic. The putt on 16 when it fell, that was as about as animated as I get, and, and it meant that much to me. All of a sudden, the lead is three. To see that one fall and take a three up lead with two to play, you know, I thought, that was the one. Playing one hole behind Spieth, Johnson was playing catcher. Yeah. Beautifully done. Needing some help, Johnson received it from a most unexpected source. This is headed well right. That looked like Grace's swing off the last tee. You think there's a little bit of nerves out there, Brad? Well, I was Scott. just about to say, nobody looks less nervous than Jordan Spieth, but easily the worst swing of the day. That's the biggest miss I've seen in Jordan in four days. And it is a nasty lie. There's just no way to go at this. But he's got uh, some weeds right in front of it. It's going to be very difficult to control the speed. It was Johnson's turn to take advantage. You watch Dustin needing a big finish now. Good night. Oh. In contrast to Grace, Spieth, and Johnson, Louis Oosthuizen cruised to the finish. And now the birdie at 18. His epic performance on the back nine put the name Oosthuizen in the record books. Tying the lowest score for nine holes with a 29 on the last nine here at Chambers Bay. That's in the history of the U.S. Open. For the time being, he was the leader in the clubhouse. Oosthuizen's historic back nine meant that to beat him, somebody would need to come in at five under or better. But funny things happen late in major championships. A 
I did what I could to, on that second shot. I think it was as good a sh second shot as I could hit. And then just didn't get the job done on, on the next, you know, the next couple putts. Who would have guessed that Jordan Spieth, a 21-year-old with the golfing head of a man twice his age, would make such an unforced error? Oh, incredible. His double bogey there left him at four under par and suddenly tied with Oosthuizen. I, I tell you what, Brad, out of the last three or four holes, I don't think I've seen anything like this. Have you? Double bogey by Grace, double bogey by Spieth. I didn't think I had lost it after 17, but I thought that I needed to play 18 well just to play tomorrow. Still at 16, Johnson had a chance to make a move. Needs to make a putt. Hit it. Oh my goodness. It was a little bit uphill, but you got to give it a chance. Spieth's tee shot on 17 had put his U.S. Open Championship hopes in jeopardy. Now Johnson faced the very same hole with the very same title hopes. Yeah. Boy, that landed right on top of the shoulder of that bunker. Easily the best shot I've seen since I've been sitting here. Johnson's pinpoint approach on 17 sparked the crowd. And the cheers reverberated around the corner to the tee box on 18. With that reaction behind him, Spieth had to back off. When I'm on 18 tee box and, and hear the roar on 17 because he, he fed it in there close to the hole, I knew that, that I needed a birdie uh, for a playoff is, is what I thought. I hit it right on the middle of the face. I looked up and it was bleeding right. I just asked for the wind to hold it up just a little bit. Softly. Real soft. Oh, it's not soft. That was yeah, he's going to be okay. It stays short of the bunker. And a little bit on the upslope with that drain, Joe. That's going to help him tremendously for his second shot. I'm sitting there thinking, how in the world did that stay up? But it, I guess it was just my day. Meanwhile, back on 17. Positive stroke there for Johnson. Knocking in his putt for birdie, Johnson pulled into a tie with Oos Hazen and Spieth at minus four just as a refocused Spieth planned out his second shot on 18. You got it, Michael. Got 250 adjusted front, 287 hole. 287 hole? Yeah, he's got it down off the right. Just up the three was definitely off the right. Yeah, I think it's a good club. You got that little backstop there. It's not gonna be too much, right, as long as I cut it? Yeah, it's just gotta be cut. Because it's an upslope, I like this club. Yep. I agree. Just got to get there, too, you know? Yep. All right, come on. Let's picture that one, buddy. You know, what I did bring was just really good vibes. In the end, it comes down to Jordan being an unbelievable player, and I just tried to stay out of the way. Hit it, wind. Hit it, wind. Any wind up there, hit it a little bit. In midair, I was going to be pleased anywhere on the green. What a shot. Awesome shot. You don't think this kid hasn't got it? He proved it at the Masters. He's proving it here. All week long, Johnson had amazed with his distance and accuracy off the tee. There was no better time for one of his patented drives. This is on a great line, beautiful, beautiful drive. This is a stunning drive. Right up into that neck. The walk of a gunslinger coming up 18. Now it's on the 21-year-old Texan. While the eagle putt didn't drop, Spieth's birdie on 18 put him one stroke ahead of Ustase. When I finished, I didn't think I'd won, but at least I'd gone about the mental side of it the right way. Shooting five under is about as, as good as I could have done on this golf course, I think. There was now a new leader in the clubhouse, and he was one step closer to making history. The last person to win the Masters and the US Open Championship in the same year was Tiger Woods in 2002. Now, Spieth could do the same. 
But on this drama-filled Sunday, it was soon Dustin Johnson's championship to win. He'll have that punt to win it. After DJ hit a second shot in, I thought, you know, shoot, I, I may have lost this tournament. It's right there for Dustin Johnson, who has come so close three times to winning a major. If he makes the putt, he'll win the U.S. Open. I didn't enjoy not being able to control it. You know, Jason was finishing, and I was like, Michael, when is DJ going to hit this putt? You know, like... You know, hurry up, I I'm getting anxious here. You want me to, what do you want me to do, mate? You want me to finish? Oh, doesn't matter, whatever you want. I'll finish. If you... Okay. Yeah, you want me to do that? Yeah, go ahead. Whatever you want to do. That's fine. Okay. This will clear the stage for Dustin Johnson. That was just courtesy and respectful. Even par and a lot of new fans for Jason Day. Now a putt for Eagle for Dustin Johnson to win the United States Open. Now Johnson's got to make this to force the playoff. If he does, it's 18 holes tomorrow. Not an easy one. Jordan Spieth has won the U.S. Open. I don't really know what to say. I very much feel for Dustin. He deserves to be holding the trophy just as much as I do, I think, this week. It just came down to, to him being the last one to finish, and I was able to have one hole to rebound from my mistakes, and he wasn't able to get that hole. Tiger Woods was 24 when he won his first U.S. Open in 2000. Since his emergence, there has been a seismic shift in the game. It has become younger and younger, more and more athletic, and, well, more open. With his victory, Jordan Spieth became the youngest player at age 21 to win the U.S. Open championship since 1923. As has been the tradition for 115 years, the winner's name would join others on the trophy, indelibly etched in silver alongside the likes of Bob Jones, Jack Nicklaus, and Tiger Woods. That's a piece of golf history, and that's very special, and it gives me goosebumps. Those names are the greatest that have ever played the game, and I don't consider myself there, but certainly off to, I think, the right start in, in order to make an impact on the history of the game. Please join me in welcoming the 115th United States Open champion, Jordan Spieth. Congratulations. It was a landmark U.S. Open championship, as Spieth turned Chambers Bay into his personal stage and emerged as the lasting image, a final symbol of history being made before the world's eyes. The new course, ambitious in its design, was at times imperfect, but that, too, was part of the unsurpassed drama. This U.S. Open at Chambers Bay, amid the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, had done what all U.S. Open venues are charged with. It had challenged the best players in the world. It had inspired not only them, but us as well. And in the end, it identified the best golfer in the world, and maybe the best caddy golfer team in the world, too. What a week. Rory McIlroy of Northern Ireland making a Sunday charge that brought to mind Arnold Palmer in his prime. Chambers Bay welcomed the new and the familiar. Brandon Grace and Louis Oosthuizen, South Africans reflecting a global game and its broadening reach. A young man from Australia showed what it meant to be down but not out. And a Floridian awed with his drives and his brush with immortality. And it all unfolded on a majestic playing field hard by the Puget Sound under the watchful eye of Mount Rainier. In the end, a worthy champion emerged. In the end, 
script-worthy drama had taken our breath away. In the end, history had been made, and the game was served notice for more of what is likely to come.